Boston University School of Medicine. He's been very active in both medical student and resident education throughout his career. He is a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers and is the course director for the HMS, Harvard Medical School CME course on motivational interviewing. Uh, his research has received funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School. In 2018, he was awarded a NIDA K-23 Career Development Award to receive mentor training in conducting clinical trials and to study the impact of recovery coaches on buprenorphine treatment outcomes. He is a sought out speaker both locally and nationally and currently serves on a variety of committees, work groups, and task forces for Partners Healthcare, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts Hospital Association, and the state of Massachusetts to address the opioid epidemic. So on a personal level, I just want to share that Dr. Suzuki uh, was a mentor of mine in a residency and especially in fellowship, um, taught me a lot about consultation in addiction psychiatry. Uh, I wish we had more Dr. Suzuki's in the field of uh, addiction psychiatry because he's just such a wonderful educator and colleague. And uh, of course, he's doing a lot of cool things at the Brigham that have inspired some of our efforts in uh, general hospital consultation here and, and with our bridge clinic. So I'm very excited for everyone to get to meet him. And without any further ado, I will pass mm. the torch. Well, th thank you so much, David. That's such a generous introduction. I probably should have sent you a much shorter bio. Uh, so um, thank you for covering that again. I'm very um, honored to be invited. Um, <clears throat> this is a, such a wonderful opportunity. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. We are too. Um, but, but perhaps, you know, again, we're talking about how the, because of the debate last night, potentially flying in last night would have been a, a nightmare. But anyway, uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll get started and I'll really do my best to try to, you know, um, have some time at the end uh, for a question and answers. And so let me share my screen. Is that coming through? Okay, excellent. <clears throat> um, so here's a, do I need to keep this up on the screen for a while or? I think you're okay because Jenny has it as her name in Zoom, so. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so I, I have no um, sort of a reportable financial conflicts of interest other than the, the grants I do receive from the, from the organizations shown on the screen. Um, I think everybody knows we're, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis. Uh, there's three waves that people describe. Uh, <clears throat> the, the initial prescription opioid epidemic, then the heroin, then now the synthetic opioids. Um, what's been troubling you know, for, for folks in the addiction field has been this fact, which hasn't really budged much at all in the last uh, couple of years, which is that among those with a substance use disorder in the United States, the vast majority received no formal treatment. This, is, this includes outpatient, inpatient, uh, recovery support services, AA meetings, NA meetings, all combined, uh, probably less than 10% actually received treatment. And as sort of the, 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 the study shows, you know, this hasn't changed a whole lot. Now, of course, you know, this is a proportion. So at least more people are entering, entering treatment, but the proportion hasn't changed at all. And so the fact that only 10% or so of people receiving treatment in a given year is really something that we really struggle with. Now, the consequence of this is, I believe, that people go untreated uh, and the sort of the medical complications of their, uh, you know, drug use accumulates. And when it comes to injection drug use specifically, um, I think the consequences are really horrendous. And what we see in, the, in hospital clinicians have been seeing this and emergency room physicians have been seeing this is that there's been a gradual and steady increase in hospitalizations and ED visits for opioid related complications um, across the country. Uh, Massachusetts just happens to be one of the places where uh, we have the highest per capita opioid related ED uh, emissions and I think number th the third highest hot opioid related hospitalizations in the country. So we've been pretty hit pretty hard, unfortunately. Um, and one of the things I really highlight and stress is that these encounters in the hospital or emergency room, this is data from um, Massachusetts looking at people related overdose and examined uh, any healthcare contacts in the year prior. And this is data from 2014, so it's a little dated, uh, but you know, <clears throat> this is using a, sort of an old data set. But even using the old data set, um, uh, upwards to you know, more than 20% uh, of the patients who had overdose and died had an encounter in the emergency room or had a hospitalization related to serious infection in the year prior. 
And what this suggests is that, and, and you know, Mark LaRochelle, who did the study, is convinced that this number has gone up dramatically in the last, you know, six, seven years. It could be high as 30% or even more, meaning that, you know, these hospital and emergency room encounters are very important, critical, uh, you know, touch points where we need to intervene to change the, you know, the trajectory of this individual. And so um, <clears throat> what I want to do is sort of cover some of these sort of key areas that I think are sort of relevant to thinking about hospitalized OUD patients and, and what we can be doing. And really the, where we start is the eviction consult service. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, this is, uh, you know, there's a clear recognition now that we need to be treating a substance use disorder um, in addition to the medical complications that people suffer from. And, you know, it seems so obvious to say, but still the norm across most hospitals in this country is that you treat the complications, but the treatment for the substance use disorder is deferred to somebody else. Um, because of lack of resources, lack of you know, expertise, uh, you know, all kinds of reasons really contribute to that. Um, but so I think one of the, the, the more recent and more obvious implementation you know, strategy is to implement a addiction consult service to bring that expertise in. Um, and, then there, and, and Dave has uh, uh, written a really nice paper and I cite it down there about the different ways that this consult service can be uh, you know, uh, created. And really there are many, many models out there and depending on each hospital, you're gonna have to create what works for that particular hospital. It could be freestanding, it could be embedded, it could be addiction medicine, addic addiction psychiatry, uh, it could be you know, made up of just a social worker, a nurse practitioner, peer support, all kinds of uh, you know, approaches. And uh, the consult service can be really helpful in facilitating the delivery of evidence-based uh, you know, medical services, psychiatric services, psychosocial interventions, but also help the hospital you know, develop guidelines and approaches. But I think one of the biggest factors that, um, uh, is the actually changing the culture uh, and, and sort of facilitating education of trainees. I, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, you know, when I talk to hospitals that, that don't do a whole lot of addiction services but want to start something, a lot of people think, assume that the first thing to do is launch a Suboxone clinic. Um, but I actually don't necessarily agree with that. I think that if, if, if you're gonna put some money into some intervention first, um, you might wanna consider just hiring a addiction consult, consultant in the hospital. Because you know, tr medical trainees disproportionately spend their time in the hospital setting. Um, you know, interns and residents spend a lot of time in the hospital. And having an addiction person available it really forces the team to think about, you know what, we can call, call Dr. Markovitz to help us out. Um, so trainees earlier on in their medical careers begin to realize that we can actually address the substance use and not just the medical psychiatric complications. Um, does it have an impact? There's a real growing evidence base around the impact of addiction consult service. This is just a sort of a snapshot on what's out there. You know, uh, the Honor Englander in, in, in uh, Oregon, um, <clears throat> there are folks up in the University of Maryland, there, there, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, groups out there doing interesting work. And really the, the, the preponderance of the evidence is that having a consult service will increase engagement with addiction treatment, both within the hospital and outside, uh, reduction in uh, discharge against medical advice, or now there's a trend to call it patient-directed discharges, uh, reduction in readmissions, uh, and some studies showing some potential reduction in mortality. So uh, I think there's a real growing evidence base that this type of intervention can really make a difference uh, both in the hospital and, and afterwards. At our hospital specifically, um, we have a, <coughs> uh, addiction consult service that's embedded within a larger psychiatry consult service um, and sort of the, the makeup is sort of shown there about 800 consults a year uh, divided between the physicians and social workers and um, when it comes to you know hospitalized patients with serious infections which is a sort of bulk of you know I think Dave might remember when he was a fellow probably the majority of the OUD patients that came for consultation had a serious infection of some kind endocarditis abs abscess you know osteomyelitis septic arthritis and what we do now is really encourage our medical teams to call us on day one of the diagnosis. Because uh, historically, you know, we would get these consults, third admission or the second discharge AMA or, you know, on the day of discharge, they, they sort of think about, oh, maybe this patient should get some addiction treatment, you know. But now we actually say on day one of diagnosis. And actually our ID colleagues also push for this. If they see that we were not involved, uh, they make sure that we're, we're, we're involved. And because similar themes emerge. Whether it's a serious infection or not, actually, you know, there's discussions around medication treatment, initiation or continuation of it, disposition planning, minimizing the you know, chance that they're going to leave against medical advice, pain management is a huge component, uh, you know, evaluation for OPAD, which I'll be talking about uh, in a, in a later, later today. Um, so similar themes really emerge, and I think having the addiction consult service can really make a big difference. 
Um, so I'm really going to go through, you know, again, many of these similar themes that really emerge during these hospitalizations that the addiction consult service sort of helps us sort of uh, navigate. And I think the biggest one really has to be this issue of using medications for OUD, um, including buprenorphine and methadone for hospitalized patients. Um, it's still not the norm. It's not the standard of care. Uh, that hospitals utilize buprenorphine or methadone for patients with OUD. And by the way, I know MAT has been historically the term we use, but there's a, trend, there's a real push towards using MOUD as a specific term to indicate medications for OUD or MAUD you know, for medications for AUD, for example. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a recent study that uh, came out of the VA that showed that out of the OUD patients hospitalized at the VA hospital, only 2% were offered MOUD uh, during the hospitalization and linked to ongoing treatment. So uh, again, you know, highly underutilized. And you know, we were one of the earlier adopters around 2013, 2014, we started uh, utilizing buprenorphine for hospitalized patients and there was really no turning back. It was sort of unthinkable to go back to a time when it was not uh, available. And we're, we're continue to be uh, you know, convinced that both buprenorphine and methadone are actually very critical. Uh, both options should be, should be made available. Um, one of the barriers is there's still an ongoing myth that you can't provide buprenorphine to hospitalized patients if you don't have the X waiver. Um, uh, so this has been you know, uh, uh, written about and, and, and it's very clear you are permitted to dispense methadone or buprenorphine to hospitalized patients, both medically and psychiatrically. So this applies to general medical hospitals and psychiatric hospitals, as long as the admission diagnosis was not OUD, which typically happens, for example, at a detox facility. Um, so at detox, is ironically, you cannot dispense buprenorphine or methadone unless you have a specific approval to do so. But if you go to a medical hospital, a psychiatric hospital, you typically admit it for some other indication. And in those settings, you can dispense buprenorphine or methadone without any special license. Of course, at the time of discharge, that's a very different story. Um, and uh, so again, the utilization of buprenorphine and methadone, I think are highly important and addiction consult service can really help facilitate that. And just the use of medications alone has, you know, has an impact. One of the important studies that came out of the Boston Medical Center is showing that comparing to, uh, you know, just doing a detox in the hospital versus starting buprenorphine and writing a prescription and linking them to ongoing treatment, the linkage rate, meaning the, sex, the, the likelihood that the person showed up at the, at the first appointment after hospitalization was 72% versus 10%. 70% uh, being those who received the buprenorphine prescription and the dog on treatment, 10% for those who just got a detox. Um, and this is, you know, uh, this mirrors our clinical experience of it. Uh, there's a big difference between, you know, starting treatment and continuing it versus just detox. And this is just a, you know, continuation of the d data that shows that detox alone is, uh, leads to really poor outcomes. Um, uh, initiating, initiating medications also leads to reduction in readmissions, um, and also for those who need IV antibiotics, it, it leads to greater uh, completion of an antibiotics, which is clearly very important. Um, but in terms of the longer term impacts, um, it's actually not as um, rosy uh, in a way, for, especially for those with serious infections. And this is a study that we did looking at uh, just under you know, 30 patients who were started on either buprenorphine or methadone or rejected, rejected both with endocarditis. Um, and this is a long term follow up study looking out. Uh, up to five years out. And what we were able to show is that actually, whether they started medications or not, uh, mortality was, was no different. And then repeat episodes of endocarditis was no different um, among these groups. And um, now, of course, this is a very tiny study. And so it was hard to you know, make any firm conclusions. But just uh, uh, what this shows is that 30%, 30 to 40% actually had a repeat episode of endocarditis within two to three years. Uh, that's all for, you know, across the board, whether they had medications or not. I mean, that's a large number of reinfections. This is not recurrence of the initial infection. This is repeat infections. And we only looked at endocarditis. And so if you included other types of infections, uh, the, the number quickly accumulates. And just hot off the press, it came out, uh, you know, just recently, a um, study out of Boston Medical Center looking at the entire state looking at what's called the Chapter 55 data set um, uh, from 2011 to 20, 2015, 679 uh, discharges for, for endocarditis from injection drug use. Um, the study confirmed what we saw in the smaller study is that the medication utilization, although what they, they couldn't really assess whether the medication was started in the hospital, they go and look at whether the medication was started within three months of discharge. Um, uh, and for those who did start medication treatment within three months of discharge, there was no difference in mortality outcomes in the first year. Um, and I believe they didn't really show any difference in reinfection rates. Uh, I think that that's going to come in a uh, subsequent publication. So suggesting that, of course, we should be utilizing medications during the hospitalization. Uh, it impacts other things like pain management and things, other things I'll be talking about. 
But in terms of longer term outcomes, it be becomes very clear. You know, medication is not end all be all. There's so much more that needs to happen for these patients. And the hospitalized patients with OUD may represent a particularly vulnerable population uh, who, are, who are at risk for, you know, for bad outcomes like overdoses and, and reinfections. Um, and one of the things that we really try to highlight also is that there's a growing evidence base now to show that any reduction in injection frequency leads to reduction in infection frequency. So we tend to focus on, you know, abstinence. Of course, you know, we want our patients to be abstinent, but there's, you know, this, this data uh, I looked at, um, this is a prospective uh, study, I'm forgetting where, I think Canada, um, <clears throat> where they track people's injection frequency uh, and um, with endocarditis and looked at the, the occurrence of uh, additional endocarditis uh, infections in the subsequent you know, time, time, time points. And what they're able to show is that those individuals, uh, th these were all individuals who were injecting at least daily. And they categorized people into people, people who kept injecting daily, people who reduced it, and people who, who stopped completely. Of course, people who stopped their injections actually had a lower rate of you know, new, new infections. Although Many of them still did, unfortunately, but even a reduction alone had an impact, suggesting that you know we probably should be, when we think about these hospitals, hospitalized OED patients with serious infections, you know we should be thinking about uh, you know uh, not just medication treatment but other things. I mean, I'll be talking a little bit more about the trauma issue, um, advice around seeking medical care if they have any. Uh, symptoms that are suggestive of, you know, future infections. Um, should we do, be doing more safe injection uh, training? Um, and really actually saying to these patients, look, for you, you're not like other suboxone patients that we treat. You know, once you're out of here, you, you know, you need your IV antibiotics completed, but after that, you're not out of the woods. You know, your long-term trajectory is actually not that great. And for you, if you have a fever, you got to seek medical care right away. Because we already know these are the patients who delay seeking medical care at all costs. You know, that's the last thing they want to do is come into the hospital. So this, these kinds of data really make us think much more about how should we be you know, advising and treating these patients potentially differently than the ones who, who are not being hospitalized or having these serious infections. All right, I just want to quickly touch upon microdosing because I think this is coming up much more frequently in the inpatient setting. It may be less so in the outpatient setting. So you know, I'd be curious to know how, how much of microdosing strategies you guys are employing uh, at Vanderbilt. But this all really started in the last couple of years where there's been a growing recognition that fentanyl users, illicit fentanyl users are experiencing precipitated withdrawal during buprenorphine inductions. You know, it's sort of odd to talk about this because essentially, you know, for the first decade and a half of buprenorphine being available, we thought we figured out how to do inductions. And so it's kind of odd that we have to go back and re-examine these issues. But there's a growing reports of people, despite going through the standard induction procedure, having horrible precipitated withdrawal. Uh, and this is just a paper that sort of describes a patient account of it. And there's multiple sort of, you can go around looking, looking for these and people are reporting, look, I go through the standard procedure and I still have precipitated withdrawal. And initially many physicians and pre pre prescribers were sort of not believing it. They assumed that the patient must be doing something wrong. Um, but this is now we, you know, we have, we're pretty clear uh, that, that this is a real phenomenon, that for whatever reason, uh, patients are using illicit fentanyl pre predominantly are having these you know, horrible procedure withdrawal. And we just did a case series also showing that you know, people who had a cow score prior to induction as high as 11 or even 25, uh, with waiting at least 20 hours, for example, still had procedure withdrawal. We're not sure why. Um, you know, uh, the fentanyl pharmacology is actually well described. It's been around for four decades or so. So we know what, what it does in humans. Um, there's no active metabolites. It is hyperlipophilic, so it may accumulate. Um, is that the reason why? You know, but that's probably, we think that's the reason that people using illicit fentanyl using such high doses compared to surgical patients, for example. There could be other reasons. Um, but this has sort of catalyzed our, our thinking about do we need, you know, other induction, you know, approaches. Um, but in the inpatient setting, actually, what comes up more is actually the methadone to buprenorphine transition. Um, we, we just had a case a couple weeks ago where a patient was having QT prolongation and on 100 milligrams of methadone. And uh, the cardiology team was like, no, this guy has to come off. Um, and so we had to figure out, uh, you know, do, is there, uh, you know, do we do, could we do the microdosing strategy to get people off methadone rapidly? Um, up until now, actually, there are only two other choices. One is go through the party line, which is reduce the methadone down to 30 milligrams a day, wait at least sort of two days, wait for the cow score of 13, you know, higher, and then do the induction. But of course, that takes months, uh, if not weeks, you know, for, you know, usually. Another is actually you can do a naltrexone per se withdrawal and rescue with buprenorphine. But we did that once, we published on it, but we think that we will never like to re repeat that ever again. It's sort of a horrible thing to watch. 
Um, and there are also patients who actually can't tolerate the withdrawal uh, during the induction, although that's really not been our experience usually. Uh, but these are the you know, situations, especially in the inpatient setting, where uh, microdosing strategy may be quite useful. And the basic idea is that you start uh, sublingual buprenorphine before, before the emergence of withdrawal. Which, you know, during our training, we talk about how the importance of that, but it turns out as long as the first dose is small, micro dose, 0.5 milligrams or less, you don't precipitate withdrawal. Um, actually, you can use uh, Belbuca, which is another, you know, uh, sublingual formulation for chronic pain, or Butrans. Uh, but, you know, for, for uh, hospital setting, I probably can use all, any of them. The whole process takes longer than a regular induction. Um, three to 10 days is a common sort of duration of a microdosing. And there is, some emergence of withdrawal during the protocol, uh, but overall well tolerated. There's at least one case that did in, uh, report a severe placebo withdrawal with using this procedure. So caution is still warranted. This is only you know, this is still case report level data. Um, but you know, I talked to other hospitals, and it sounds like every day I hear about a new hospital that's now making this their standard approach. I think we're not there yet. Um, but so I'm curious to hear if you guys, how much are you guys are utilizing this? This is an example from Stanford. This is their approach, which I actually like, in our old, uh, Brigham would likely we're going to adopt uh, so, something similar. Um, they're on full agonist opioids. On day one, you simply slap on the 20 microgram butrans patch. Uh, and then day two, you start sublingual buprenorphine, starting at two, go up to eight. Day three, uh, repeat and go up to 16. And then day four, you take, off them, you take them off the full agonist opioids take off the patch, and you're now on sublingual buprenorphine alone. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and this is their, so, you know, some of their data that they reported. It, here's an example, six-year-old lady with OUD, uh, you know, coming with an opioid overdose, 135 um, uh, MME on day zero. That was tapered over the course of, you know, several days. Uh, and then uh, the, the third line is actually the buprenorphine dose. So four milligrams, eight milligrams, 10 milligrams on day two, three, and four. And five, that's cow score. You know, so mild withdrawal that emerged, but it went down to zero by the time, by day four. Um, kind of remarkable. And these are other examples. This is from um, Colorado. And this is an inpatient protocol transitioning from methadone to, to sublingual. And it's an eight day protocol. It's starting with 0.5, you know, uh, like the, uh, you know, I mentioned. Um, and this is what they report, which is sort of kind of frightening to think about, but the patient's on 100 milligrams of methadone the entire time. Or for the whole week while the buprenorphine is slowly being increased. And so in the inpatient setting where these rapid inductions are, are needed, especially for methadone to bup or you know, high-dose full agonist opioids to bup, um, I think a lot of hospital systems are now incorporating microdosing strategy. I think for the outpatient, the, the protocol has to be modified quite a bit, even though that's where it was all started. The Bernese method is how was, the initial paper was describing out of uh, Austria, Bern, I, I forget, um, describing this sort of, you know, uh, cross titration of low dose buprenorphine and high dose. Uh, and in that case, they were using uh, pharmaceutical heroin and high dose methadone, actually. Um, and so I, I don't know if, Dave, if you guys are actually using microdosing or not in the inpatients. Um, this is another good example of what you need an addiction consult service to help facilitate this, even decide whether to do it, come up with a protocol, um, and uh, make that transition easier. I'm really glad to hear about this and to see the real the specifics, uh, Dr. Suzuki. I know Chris Ka Chris Cass is on this grand rounds, and I think he's probably also paying close attention. We haven't done it yet, but I think it's really exciting opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know uh, we're we're permitted to use Butrans for this purpose, and that actually obviates the need to cutting into the 0.5 dose. You know, to the sublingual, you know, sublingual bup comes in two milligrams, the smallest. And it creates problems when you have to cut it into little pieces. It turns out our, our nurses are willing to do it, but it'd be a lot easier to just do butrans to sublingual without cutting it. Um, but yeah, it, it's an emerging approach and it's kind of cool that they're, you know, we thought, again, we thought we knew how to do inductions and, and now there are novel ways to do it. So it's pretty cool. Um, I just want to keep moving because of the time. Um, discharge against medical advice, or like I mentioned, there's a trend towards calling this patient-directed discharges. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, this occurs at high rates uh, for those who are admitted to the hospital with the OUD. Um, there's greater data around discharge amines for people with endocarditis. Uh, there's tremendous amount of interest. We just published a paper on national data looking at the national inpatient sample. On average, 20% of patients with serious infections, um, endocarditis, osteo, et cetera, end up being discharged against medical device nationally. That's across the board. I mean, and we think that's an underestimation because a lot of these discharges simply occur 
where the patient gets a PO or oral antibiotics and sort of send off their way. And it's, it, it doesn't count as a discharge AMA, but still it's very clear. It's one order, order of you know, magnitude higher than the general population who are hospitalized, where it is typically around one to 2% across, you know, uh, for, 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 for in this country. Um, and discharge AMA is always, almost always a bad outcome and leads to greater readmissions higher mortality, you know, if they're in there for a serious infection, the infection doesn't go away. <laughs> Just because you leave AMA, you're gonna have to come back at some point. Um, but it, it turns out that the estimates vary across hospitals. You know, for us, it's about 15%-ish or so, but some hospitals for certain infections, like endocarditis, rates are high as 50%. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some hospitals where it's even higher. Um, and many common themes that emerge as contributing factors, inadequate treatment of opioid withdrawal, cravings, you know, they're in pain, that's being take, taken seriously, uh, stigmatized, you know, um, by, by the staff, and or hospital restrictions. Um, all kinds of things contribute, and these are, uh, you know, common themes that emerge. Um, it turns out that, you know, we don't have good ways to, to minimize this. Um, we know that hospitalizations are distressing experiences for, for any patients, um, but this particular patient population are, you know, likely to be much more vulnerable to, to having adverse, you know, outcomes. Um, and, you know, when they come into the hospital, especially if it's a serious infection, they didn't, they're not necessarily, ex necessarily expecting that they're going to be stuck in the hospital for six weeks, that they have a life-threatening illness, that they might need open-heart surgery, and they might need IV antibiotics for, you know, for many, many weeks, that they might not be able to leave the floor. Uh, you know, I mean, all kinds of things suddenly get thrust upon them, and now they also feel sick. They might end up in the ICU. I mean, all kinds of things happen, and these are, you know, patients may not be ready for it at all. Um, and, uh, but it, so, you know, we want to try to find a way to, you know, impact that. Um, we assume that medication use, you know, I talked about the buprenorphine methadone, is going to reduce the likelihood of people leaving AMA. And actually, our own data suggested that it didn't, um, but other studies do show that using medications uh, do reduce discharge AMA rates. And we think that it's because, thankfully, Massachusetts, half the patients who show up in, in the hospital with the OUD actually are already on medication treatment, um, up to half. Um, other studies from other locations show 0%. Um, I'd be curious you know, what, what your experience has been, but if you, if the if zero percent of the patients are on medication treatment admission, uh, utilization of medication during hospitalization uh, for those studies show a dramatic reduction in discharge AMA. For us, I think, luckily, many of the patients who already want to be on medication treatment are already on it. They're still struggling. They're still using. You know, it's, it's not perfect. Um, but you know, using it from the hospital has less of an impact on discharge AMA. It, it, I think it impacts other things, but not on the discharge AMA itself. But still, I would strongly argue, you know, that the use of medications will lead to reduction in discharge AMA because uh, poor pain control and poor withdrawal and cravings management is a big contributing factor uh, to, to to this occurring. Okay, so so pain management. This is a such a common theme that emerges and is an important consideration for hospitalized OUD patients um, because I am convinced that hospitalized OUD patients. Well, and I'm sorry, PWID, that's people who inject drugs. Uh, there are different acronyms we use. Uh, uh, sorry, so P PWID, people who inject drugs, receive very, very poor pain control in the hospital setting. Um, by the fact that many of these individuals are using opioids, high-dose illicit opioids, they have significant opioid tolerance. So it becomes harder to manage their pain with, with opioids, clearly. If they're in withdrawal, that contributes to pain. And also they have significant fears about honest disclosures of their drug use. This is something that we see over and over and over. Um, if, you, if you deal with hospitalized you know, addiction patients, this is a common phenomenon. When they first appear in the hospital ED or you know, you, when you encounter them in a consult setting, you ask, so when, you know, when did you last use? Very frequently patients say something like, oh, I haven't used it in three months or six months uh, because it's, that's sort of a safe compromise. It's, it's acknowledging you know, drug use by sort of it's it's mitigating this sort of you know stigma around well i haven't been using though you know because I'm, i want to be abstinent and, and i'm not using but of course that may be true but oftentimes it's not you know their their urine is positive for fentanyl and whatnot and so we kind of have a sense that they have been using and their own withdrawal you know um but of course what happens you know is that when the truth comes out uh let's say in the context of you know pain is still pretty bad the patient asking for more dilated and oh, by the way, I, I, I wasn't telling the truth. I actually have been using heroin until the day of admission. And so then, then the team will say, oh, I see. So you were lying, you know? And so it kind of reifies this image of these patients are liars, you know? And so, but patients are stuck in this spine. You know, in healthcare settings, they've repeatedly experienced that honest disclosure about drug use is punished. It's never rewarded. 
you know, honest disclosures about drug use is sort of met with, you know, heightened critic, you know, suspicion about, oh, is this patient drug seeking? It's, you know, patients know this. So anyway, this contributes again to poor pain control and finally hyperalgesia. Opioid induced hyperalgesia is something that's uh, likely, con you know, contributing factors that very quickly when you do cold pressure tests where you stick a water in, you know, ice cold water and you measure how long it takes to the person to experience pain and how long it takes to withdraw the hand because of pain. Um, this particular study, what they did was they did the cold pressure test at baseline for chronic pain patients. And then they put them on morphine, about 30 milligrams a day for 30 days. And they brought them back and then repeated the cold pressure test. And now they've been on morphine 30 milligrams for 30 days. Obviously their pain went down. So the pain has improved over the course of that 30 days. But the cold pressure test tells a different story. Um, at, from baseline to the three month, there's a reduction in the time it takes to experience pain. So about 16%, and about 24% reduction in the time it takes to withdraw the hand because the pain becomes intolerable. So despite the fact that pain is now better, the, the nervous system adapts to this by becoming more sensitive to pain. This is after one month of 30 milligrams of morphine. And so studies have you know, since confirmed this fact, opioid induced hypoalgesia is a real thing, happens quickly. And this is exactly why the opioid crisis happened. You know, patients were initially receiving five milligrams of oxycodone for chronic pain. Great, it worked. But over time, pain came back. Um, pain worsened. Now they take 10 milligrams. Pain is better. Eventually it comes back. So you get into a situation where they're on 500 milligrams of oxycodone and they're still in pain, um, you know, because of opioid induced hyperalgesia and intolerance that develops, you know, to it. So we are convinced that individuals using high-dose illicit opioids have significant opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Um, so all those things combined make it really challenging to control their pain. And one of the things that I've seen over and over um, is that there's, been, there's a lot of data around how to manage chronic pain patients without using opioids. Multimodal approaches, risk assessment tools, risk stratification tools, you know, monitoring strategies, PDMP, you know, all kinds of tools are being used to safely treat chronic pain, minimizing the use of opioids. And when people started thinking about, okay, how do we do opioid treatment in the hospital safely? Too often, they, they borrow the chronic pain management strategy to the acute pain context, which I think can be really, really uh, 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 problematic. Part of the reason is acute pain is very different from chronic pain in terms of the pathophysiology, et cetera. But... In the chronic pain setting, you're trying to minimize opioid use and using it only as a last resort because that allows for, you know, for, for patients to succeed in multimodal approaches first and only you know, using opioids at, you know, uh, when really, really needed. Um, but in acute pain, when you do that, you necessarily undertreat pain and the OUD patients who are actually more likely to experience more pain are even more severely undertreated. Um, and so the way we recommend this approach is this sort of dichotomy that you see on the screen is that, um, you know, in chronic pain situations, you know, you, you sort of avoid opioids because patients may be drug seeking. You don't want to unnecessarily provide opioids. You only want to do it when you're absolutely necessary, you know. So this allows for patients to go untreated with opioids, but ensures that, you know, nobody receives opioids un inappropriately. That approach, in my mind, fails in acute pain settings. Because, uh, and th this sort of came up in, in the context of, um, of my wife's uh, uh, labor uh, during our first son. Um, uh, uh, so traumatic to even think about the, this experience. But uh, she had to, you know, have the uh, uh, epidural uh, and the, you know, <clears throat> uh, and the pitocin. Uh, the pain was coming. So, so she was getting, you know, opioids in, in the epidural. But over the course of the evening, the pain came back, kept getting worse. So we kept asking the anesthesiologist to come back and check on it, but he kept saying, everything is fine, nothing to do here, just try to relax. And by the end of the night, everybody was sort of getting annoyed. Why is she complaining of pain still? Even the nurses were sort of wondering. Uh, even I was, at, I think I didn't say anything, um, I, but I was getting annoyed. Um, and the next morning, the new shift occurred and the anesthesiologist came on board. She said, look, you know, I heard you're having a hard, hard time. Let me do a quick exam. She sort of, you know, did her thing and said, look, it's pretty straightforward. The epidural came out. That's why you're in pain. Um, and so we were, of course, all horrified at this experience because, but as we were huddling with the nurses, you know, the question came up. But when I was in labor, she had a legitimate medical reason to be in pain. 
was saying she was in pain, but people around her wasn't believing her. Now, what else was she supposed to do? She's in pain. She needed treatment. She wasn't getting it. What are you supposed to do? So in situations, when the pain complaint goes, you know, or is not believed, then patients are screwed. They, I mean, it, it is a horrible situation. That's exactly why many of these patients, you know, mistrust the hospital setting because they believe that their pain complaints will be ignored. So, and you know, so what I what we really stress in the hospital setting, you know, to our fellows and you know, you know, other other you know colleagues is, look, in this situation, the first thing we got to do is let's let's treat the pain and believe the pain first, and then collect the evidence for why we might want to withhold it. Um, and, and relying on objective data. And it shouldn't just be because, oh, you know, addict, you know patients who are addicted are liars. In my mind, that's not good enough. Um, you know, liars can also be in pain. Pa our patients suffer more pain than the typical patient. Anyway, okay, so I've said enough. So I, I really, this, I kind of harp on this because this issue comes up all the time. That's one of the probably the biggest reasons why these patients in the hospital setting, you know, have poor, you know bad experiences because their pain complaints are are are, are sort of you know uh, ignored or, or or not believed. And so, the, how do we you know how do we do this? Generally speaking, when we when we make decisions, we rely on three sort of different areas. We talk to the patient, we collect data, and we might get collateral sources to co arrive at the decision. But for hospitalized patients in this situation, this particular approach actually breaks down. And so we add this fourth element, objective behavior, and we have a tool called the hospital misuse checklist, um, and we look at certain aberrant behaviors. Um, so things of some of the things listed on there, uh, and to gather evidence more objective you know, evidence for why the current treatment may not be working. And so this sometimes we call the A criteria, things that are pointing to some problem, um, but, potentially, you know, but not necessarily diagnostic. Uh, but the B criteria, a little bit more uh, clear, you know, evidence of hoarding or cheeking, you know, they actually, we find them using drugs in the hospital room, they're overdosing. Uh, we call the white powder sign when actually uh, uh, crushed up materials are injected into IV tubing, but they don't flush it, so the white materials actually you know, uh, come back up tampering with a PCA machine or retrieving needles from the shops container. All these things are indication of, of something uh, not going so well. Um, I'm just going to keep moving along. Uh, so, and based on the risk level, you know, using this data, the aberrant behaviors, et cetera, you can actually make recommendations to the medical team. This becomes extremely helpful, for example, when it's pan negative. You know, we know that the person who is injecting drugs is put at a heightened risk, you know, that, that's unavoidable. But if they're pan negative on the aberrant behaviors, you know, we, we can much more confidently say to the team, hey, look, we know this guy's at risk, but it's, it appears that the current treatment of the acute pain is going well and there are no aberrant behaviors. So let's continue to monitor, but let's not withhold treatment. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have a similar sort of approach around peer operative management of patients already on buprenorphine. They come into the hospital on buprenorphine, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, what to do with that. So because of time, I'm not going to really go into it. Look, okay, here's what I really want to focus on as well, this idea of a trauma of hospitalization. Um, this is initially brought up, uh, you know, almost a decade ago um, in the context of talking about what's, what was called, initially called a post-hospital syndrome, that patients who are leaving the hospital are at heightened, you know, vulnerability to, to bad outcomes, readmissions, mortality, you know, et cetera. Um, but there's a growing recognition that perhaps we can conceptualize these medical encounters as traumas. You know, we don't typically think of hospitalizations as traumatic, um, but actually, you know, there's real growing evidence that, look, critical illness survivors from the ICU, within the first year, a third will be criteria for PTSD. And, and if you include sub-threshold, PTSD, the number goes up dramatically. Another interesting study out of uh, New York, about a fifth of patients who show up in the emergency room who think they're having a heart attack will have PTSD, you know, within the first, uh, you know, month. Um, so acute stress symptoms, of course, you just want to you know, parse it out. Whether you actually had a heart attack or not. So some patients, of course, just had, you know, panic attacks or other things. They didn't have a heart attack, but it didn't matter. The fact that you thought you were having a heart attack, at least to these, you know, uh, outcomes, just getting a cancer diagnosis. And there's at least one uh, study looking at endocarditis patients from non-injection drug use, about 11% in the criteria for PTSD within a year, year, year after. Um, so, you know, again, we don't talk about medical illnesses as being traumatic, but, you know, the definition of the criterion A for DSM is, you know, any threatened injury or illness or death. And critical illnesses and these life-threatening illnesses, I think, qualify. And I think we're getting a growing recognition that it is. 
Um, and one of the things that's emerging out of this data is that the biggest predictor of post-hospital PTSD is not necessarily what happens in the hospital. We, people assume that has to be, you know, something frightening, and there, there's some contribution to that, you know, um, painful procedures, you know, the duration of the hospitalization, benzo use, all kinds of things to look at. But the strongest predictor is actually pre-morbid psychopathology. If you come into the hospital already having, you know, depression, anxiety, PTSD, et cetera, you're, that's the biggest predictor for, you know, having adverse outcomes afterwards. And we already know this patient population we're talking about, OUD patients, people who inject drugs, um, have high rates of lifetime traumas and high rates of PTSD to begin with. They already have bad experiences in the hospital. Um, and so they're heightened, we believe, and actually nobody has specifically looked at that in terms of what is the you know, prevalence of PTSD among OUD patients who are hospitalized, you know, due to the hospitalization itself. Um, it's a little, a little tricky to study this. We're collecting some data now. I, I, I was in, trying to encourage Dave to do something like that as well. Um, <clears throat> but the, the reason why this is going to be important is the severity of the PTSD symptoms after hospitalization predicts not adherence to medical treatment. Um, and we think that this may be a big contributing factor to why this population, you know, among other things, do really poorly after hospitalization. So for example, we're thinking about, do we need to do much more, you know, uh, trauma-informed care training for all the staff members? Um, should we be screening for acute stress symptoms during the hospitalization, which is another sort of predictor of post-hospital PTSD? Uh, we should be more aggressively offering PTSD treatment, in, you know, in the context of post-hospital, you know, treatment. Uh, and again, this strongly argues for combining addiction treatment, psychiatric treatment, and the medical treatment, you know, particularly for this population. And let's get to the, the outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy. So because of the you know, fact that these hospitalizations can be profoundly distressing for our patients, you know, is there a way to reduce the time that they're in the hospital? And it's not just for the patients, it's for the staff as well, right? You know, many staff don't feel prepared or you know, prepared to you know, treat this patient population. Three days can be tough. Six weeks is, is really tough. <laughs> um, so is there a way to reduce it? For those individuals who come to the hospital with serious infections for endocarditis, let's say, that's not from injection drug use. The standard of care is OPEP, outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy, which is once the infection is stabilized, they get a pick line and they go home. And there are varieties of ways to do it. You can get the infusions done at home or go to infusion center, all kinds of ways to do it. But those who use drugs have been largely excluded from that for obvious reasons. The assumption has been that people who inject drugs will naturally, inevitably, tamper with their pick lines. So, we asked that question, like, is that true? Is that actually true based on the available evidence? And we you know, published a paper on it to say that actually the evidence that's been published so far does not indicate that. Overall outcomes are comparable. Readmission rates are higher than the sort of what you see in a typical OPAD you know, population, but OPAD completion rates, mortality, pick line complications across the board are actually not, not bad. So we use this to justify to our hospital after we open up our bridge clinic, let's just try this, you know, for the sake of our patients, but also for our staff and also, you know, hospital leaders love the idea of reducing length of stay, right? So, um, you know, we had very strong support from the hospital leadership. We also had to get strong buy-in from the VNAs because uh, initially they were absolutely opposed to the idea of going to any of these patients' homes, but we made it clear, we're actually implementing a actual protocol and have a whole system of place. We're not just willing to make patients home. So patients had to, you know, could, could qualify um, if everybody on the, you know, primary team, the consulting teams agreed that it was safe to do so. Patients had to be agreeable to be on medication treatment for OUD for the duration of antibiotics if the primary you know, uh, SUD was opioids. Um, and this is a big you know, uh, ex ex exclusion. They had to have stable housing. They couldn't be homeless. And if they had housing, they couldn't have any active users at home. And they have to agree to be followed up at the bridge clinic weekly, at least weekly, unless they're going to go to methadone maintenance. In that case, we actually said, look, as long as you adhere to methadone maintenance, there, that's fine. You don't have to come to the bridge clinic. And so we just published our first year outcomes. Uh, out of the 68 people who were admitted in the one year, one calendar year, about a third, you know, qualified. Um, <clears throat> and most ex common reason for exclusion was people thought it was too risky for, you know, all kinds of things. Um, endocarditis was the most common infection. So, you know, three quarters of it. 100% IV, IV antibiotic completion rate and 0% pick line complications. Everybody, you know, we, we did an exit interview at the time of pick line removal, like, hey, now that the pick line is out, can you tell us, like, were you tempted? Did you actually mess with it? Like, just tell us. Everybody across the board said, look, you know, I'm an injection drug user. I know how to inject drugs. I don't need a pick line to do it. I could have, but I'm not dumb. Look, I felt, I was grateful that I could go home. It was so much better that I could be staying at home. I wasn't going to mess that up. <clears throat> and now some did relapse. 
for those patients, they were honest with us. We picked up on it with you know, our toxicology and we simply readmitted them and completed the treatment in the hospital. And again, 100% IV, you know, antibiotic, antibiotic completion rate. And, you know, patients were happy, their families were happy, the, the hospital staff were happy, and we saved in our first year 500 inpatient days. Um, so I think that's pretty significant. Um, so the final thing is the bridge, bridge model. You know, one of the things that we discovered in, you know, doing some of this research is, um, when you look at people who were started on buprenorphine in the hospital, we asked the question, how many of them ended up in treatment after the hospitalization? You know, we did one, MGH had a study, BMC did a number of studies, and across the board, what we saw was that about 50% never made it to treatment. Despite getting a prescription, despite being, you know, uh, appointments being made for them, um, for a variety of reasons, you know, linkage to outpatient treatment, there's a big drop off. The moment that people walk out of the program, uh, you lose half of the patients. But there are a couple of studies that really pointed to some potential intervention that might make a difference. This is what you see, this red line is what you see in a typical outpatient program. Um, and the green line is actually the study that came out of Yale, the sort of the seminal, you know, the study that looked at the randomized trial of buprenorphine initiation versus, you know, brief intervention, et cetera. Almost 8% of the patients who were referred to treatment from the ED with an OUD showed up because they had a prescription for buprenorphine. But the paper didn't really get into this much, is that those patients were guaranteed an intake within 72 hours at their suboxone clinic. At, it's at their primary care program for a short term. They provide treatment for about three months and they, they will link people to, to ongoing treatment. Um, and if the clinic was open, they'd literally walk the patients over. And the BMC, the purple line, actually, they did something similar. They referred all those patients to their own clinic um, who could take patients pretty rapidly. And so these two studies really show that actually the one way to dramatically improve linkage rates is to offer timely access to treatment. Um, and so this was really the birth of the bridge clinic model. Um, and so really the idea is to allow rapid access to buprenorphine treatment and other medical treatment, psychiatric treatment, create a low barrier, low threshold. And 10 years ago, you know, um, we thought this was malpractice. We heard of a guy at MGH called, you know, um, Mark Eisenberg, who was giving out buprenorphine prescriptions to patients who just showed up, walked down the street, and we're talking about how, oh my God, that's so unsafe, that's irresponsible. Of course, he was way ahead of his time. Um, now we know, especially for OUD patients, if they want treatment, you got to, you know, strike the iron when it's hot, like right then and there. Um, and so, uh, we, you know, we launched our Birch Clinic uh, a couple of years ago and really targeting hospice patients being discharged, but also ED patients. Rapid access to on-demand, they can walk out with a pre prescription, they get, you know, basic primary care, medical, psychiatric care, there's a recovery coach, there's resource specialists, case management, um, <clears throat> and then the goal is to transition people to longer term treatment uh, somewhere else in the community or within your own system. Um, and, you know, I, I know that you guys are in, in the process of implementing one, uh, you know, uh, I know Chris has, has experience with that as well. I'd be curious to hear, you know, how that's going. Uh, all right. How are we doing with time? I think we're doing okay. So conclusion, so opioid-related hospitalizations are, you know, uh, increasing dramatically. Um, and our medical colleagues need a lot of help. You know, they've been dealing with this for a long time. And it's just so in interesting that it's only now that we're talking more about addiction consult services, uh, but they need our help and they're usually very, very grateful for it. We should be incorporating evidence-based treatment into the hospital setting, especially medication use. And we need to be very mindful of the amount of pain and distress that these hospitalizations cause, including the fact that these events may be traumatizing in itself. And then, you know, finding a way to link people to ongoing treatment is very critical. It's not just thinking about the, you know, acute episode, but how do we make this part of a, you know, beginning of a, of a you know, recovery process. All right. These are the references, and this is the last slide. All right. Joji, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, so should I just stop sharing? Um, uh, I think, I don't know, Jenny, what do you say? Um, I had one question, and then we can see if other people want to put questions in the chat box. Um, but basically, um, I noticed that slide in particular that you said just came out where patients really didn't do as well as we would have hoped with their one year uh, outcomes. Was it mortality or reinfection? Uh, so in that paper, they didn't report the reinfection. I, you know, when I spoke to Sim Kimmel, who's a P, you know, the, the first author, I, I know they looked at reinfection rates and I believe that was um, no different, uh, you know, uh, whether they started MOUD or not. But, I, but that was not in part of the paper. I, I must have been gonna publish another paper. It'll, I'm sure it'll be a JAMA, JAMA paper, yeah. 
Well, so I think we've, we've noticed certainly that some of our patients with uh, injection drug use and OUD that we start on Suboxone in the hospital or methadone are so high needs in terms of their medical and psychiatric issues that it's not surprising to see that at one year there was a little bit of divergence and then, and then it kind of came back together at the end of the year in terms of outcomes on that slide. And I know at one point your K research was going to be on how to use recovery coaches and team-based care to really move the needle. So I think we, we all recognize that more needs to be done. Have you, have you started that research? Have you learned anything? Yeah, no, we're, we're halfway through and uh, that study. I didn't include this, include that in the, in the slide because it's still preliminary data. We only have about 20 subjects, you know, randomized so far, but that's a manualized recovery coach intervention who are assigned to OUD patients in the hospital. And the, the, the goal is to try to see if that can reduce, increase linkage rates, but also six month outcomes. Um, right now we, we are showing some improvement in linkage rates, but six month outcomes, we're not seeing a huge difference. Um, but, 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 but you're absolutely right. Medication alone ain't going to cut it. You know, for the typical OUD patient, medications make a huge difference. But for this particular, you know, patient population, it's becoming clear, man, we, there, we, there's so much more that needs to be done. And, you know, um, the, 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 again, this fact about, you know, potentially many of these patients are still injecting, right? You know, I mentioned that half the patients show up in the hospital at Brigham are on medications already, but they're coming with endocarditis anyway. So it just suggests that they're in treatment, but they're still engaging in injection behavior. And maybe for the, those who don't have this serious infection history, maybe that's okay, not, not okay, but you know, they're not getting hospitalized. But you know, uh, so, so again, there's some reason why despite medication use, which will prevent the overdose, no question, but it's not gonna prevent you know, uh, infectious complications and other, other things. Hmm. And so we gotta find a way, maybe you should do much more you know, education around safe injection practices, even like wiping the skin with alcohol can reduce incidence of infections. Um, I, we sometimes discuss, should we recommend other routes of ingestion, like smoke it instead of inject it? I don't know, I don't know if that's the same thing. No, no. My recovery course thinks it's a bad idea. Um, I don't know. And there's also this concept of you know, injection, addict, being addicted to the injection practice itself, right? So some patients actually inject water because they just love the, you know, love the ritual. And is that contributing to it or not? You know, so, um, and that whole trauma issue, you know, like uh, is that unaddressed trauma that's keeping people out of the hospital, right? One of the problems with PTSD is that it leads to avoidance. If the medical event is causing PTSD, it's natural to believe that people avoid medical treatment because it's triggering. So you have to be much more, you know, forthright with our patients say, look, for you, you need to seek medical care immediately. If you relapse, if you have fever, if you have any signs that might indicate another infection, because we might be able to prevent it from blowing out of control if you wait three or four weeks before coming in, you know? Hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Um, I think we just have a couple minutes left in the hour. If anybody wants to put any questions in the chat box, I appreciate that we had a great turnout and uh, people were texting me, Joji telling me that they were enjoying your talk. So that's exciting. Here's a question. Uh, from uh, our addiction medicine fellow, Nick Connolly, are the persons who inject drugs injecting opiates while on Suboxone, or are you seeing continued injection use with methamphetamine or other substances? I mean, our assumption is that some of them are, clearly, um, and that, you know, uh, medic medication use doesn't completely suppress it. I mean, we, we know that, right? I mean, we know that it will reduce the frequency for many patients, and it can facilitate being completely abstinent. But I think it just, it just highlights potentially that those who end up getting hospitalized for these serious infections may represent a particularly more serious cohort of OUD patients, right? I mean, that, that's my, that, that would be my guess, is that you know, they're not just randomly getting infected with endocarditis. I mean, it's still a relatively rare complication overall, but it's devastating, as you know, as you know and high mortality. Many, many studies will show 5, 10, 50% in hospital mortality. Um, this is a life-threatening illness. And so our assumption is that people continue to inject um, all kinds of things. We're very lucky that, you know, lucky, you know, that opioids is like 100% of our patients get hospitalized with serious infections are opioid users. Um, but, you know, many other parts of the country, you know, meth is a huge part of it. And so that's even more, you know, frightening um, for our patients because our options are much more limited. So I know that we have a session at 3.30 later as well. So I hope to see some of you. 
Um, I, again, very honored to be invited. Sorry I can't be there. Uh, Dr. Markovitz, I appreciate your invitation. Hope this was at least, you know, uh, provided some interesting, interesting points. This was fantastic, Joji. So I, uh, I'm gonna send this last question actually to Joji and Dr. Suzuki and, uh, and, um, and copy the person who sent it so that we can get, get that question answered in case Dr. Satherwhite can't join us at 2.30. Of course, you're more than welcome if you're available to join us. Uh, and I say that to everyone on the, uh, on the call. So uh, I think that takes us to the end of the hour. Thank you again so much. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. All right. So I'll see some folks at 3.30 my time. So 2.30 your time. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right.